like uh, people have started uh, trickling in, so, or stopped trickling in, I should say. Uh, thank you for braving the snow. Hopefully the university won't close on us while we're here. Um, they turn off the lights that uh, we may need to end class a little early. At any, at any rate, um, okay, so we've been talking about indexing for the past uh, few classes. And today I'm going to follow that up with a little bit more on hash indices and a couple of uh, brief comments on how, how indices actually, or sort of a high level view on how, hash, uh, how indices in general fit into the grand scheme of things. Um, and that will sort of be a precursor to uh, optimization, which we're going to start uh, probably sometime next week. Uh, but before that happens, um, quick reminder, there is a uh, homework that is due. Uh, there will not be a homework due next week because that's when the project's due. Uh, the project is due on Monday, but um, there won't be a homework that weekend. Um, and I'm going to be actually not here on next Monday. Uh, Dr. Minsky will be uh, substituting during class. Uh, my office hours will be moved to Wednesday, just this coming week. Um, so, uh, if you have any sort of immediate questions, uh, either address them after class today, or um, or send me an email, or post to the Piazza forums. Uh, but I will not be here on Monday or Tuesday, so please keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, that said. Um, there's one that was assigned last week. Uh, there's there's one that was assigned last week. There is no homework due. Uh, so there have been homeworks due every Friday since the start of the term. And there will not be a homework uh, due next Friday. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, all right, so, ha um, so hash and disease. Uh, just to recap, uh, hash index is uh, exploits one of these crazy things called a hash function that allows us to get a fixed uh, fixed size key that allows us uh, for any record and essentially the, any any record uh, with the same values is going to get the same hash value. So we can always sort of find uh, the, the location that uh, that a record should be stored at. Um, hash indices allow us to uh, very efficiently support index, uh, support equality lookups. Uh, they do not, however, support range lookups. Um, and something we were talking about on uh, Monday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, was this idea of uh, static versus dynamic hashing, where you have uh, sort of, in one case, you can build sort of a, a static, a, a fixed size hash table um, that might be uh, sufficient for a, fix, uh, a specific data set, but if that data set starts to change a bit, uh, if you start adding and deleting records, then you might need to start adding um, extra pages uh, for each uh, so-called hash bucket. So one solution we discussed on Wednesday was this idea of extendable hashing, where if uh, one, one of these buckets becomes full, uh, what we essentially do is double the number of buckets. Now, of course, this is uh, expensive, so rather than actually doubling the number of buckets, what we end up doing is keeping uh, a level of indirection, a, uh, a, directory, uh, a directory that uh, if we need to uh, double the number of buckets, we double the number of uh, sort of entries in this directory, and then we just make sure that all of those uh, directory entries are essentially pointing to the same pages. And uh, we exploit the fact that uh, by doubling the number of pages, we need uh, essentially to consider an extra bit of the hash to decide which of these, these uh, directory entries to use. Uh, so if we just make sure that the last, uh, let's say we're doubling from uh, four to eight bits, that means we're going from uh, four to eight buckets, which means we're going from two uh, to three bits, um, what that essentially means is that we can ensure that the, uh, the pages that share the last two bits point to the same uh, bucket on disk. Whereas, uh, and if we actually need 
to split the, uh, the actual buckets on disk, we can just update the corresponding pages, uh, the, the corresponding entries in this directory to point to the right place. So this, uh, this extendable hashing uh, idea uses uh, two values, uh, a global depth and a local depth. Uh, the global depth is essentially sort of an upper bound on how many uh, bits we need to consider uh, ever. Uh, whereas the local depth, which we have one separate value for each bucket on this, is the, uh, the number of bits that uh, all of the, the uh, records in that bucket are guaranteed to share. So if we split uh, if we split one of these buckets, uh, we end up with two buckets, uh, each of which uh, differs on one extra bit. And by using sort of the last, uh, the last k bits, uh, we can very easily uh, break apart uh, these buckets and, and determine how uh, how to repartition the data. So, uh, yes. Uh, it depends on. So usually we won't create an index for just an empty uh, an empty data set. Uh, usually we'll create a, a hash table for some uh, sorry an, an index uh, for a data set that already exists. And if we do that, we have some idea of how many records we're going to need to store. Uh, usually you want to create the hash table uh, to have sufficient space uh, to store all of the records that you expect to, to have. Um, so depending on how many records you expect to fit in a page. Uh, you probably want to keep about that the, the total number of uh, records divided by the number of um, the records that you can fit in the page, and maybe some constant factor above that uh, is the number of buckets that you'd like to keep around. Um, essentially, you want to pick a, a value so that you don't hit, you don't have any overflow pages the first time you insert all of your data. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Any questions on tree or hash indices or anything else at this point? Great. Okay. Uh, so, um, in addition to extendable hashing, there is one other technique uh, that has, has has been used in databases for a while now um, called linear hashing. Um, now. The, the idea behind linear hashing is that having a directory page increases um, indirection. Uh, it has this, introduces this extra level of indirection, which means that sometimes we may actually need to do uh, two IOs to do a single lookup. Um, ideally, we, we'd like to avoid having that, that extra level of indirection and just go directly to the page that stores the value that we're interested in. So, um, Linear hashing is essentially an effort to um, allow us to do splits directly on the pages, but without uh, the, directly on the data pages, but without um, without having to uh, copy all of the pages uh, every time we need to do a split. And so uh, the, the sort of core insight, the core idea behind linear hashing, is that you don't split the entire uh, the entire hash table all at once. You don't double the, the size of, of the hash table. Um, every time you split, um, you split exactly one bucket um, and increase the size of the hash table by one. And that allows us to uh, or keep a continuous sequence of, of pages that uh, we can identify uh, which, uh, in, in such a way that we can identify uh, which page corresponds to which data value. So um, there are two, uh, two supplemental uh, values that we keep around in linear hashing. Uh, there is the level, which roughly corresponds to the global depth in, um, in extendable hashing. And there is uh, a next pointer. And the next pointer points to a single bucket. Now, uh, linear hashing operates in rounds. And at the start of each round, you end up with uh, a number of buckets equal to two to the power of the level. So uh, the level is three. You start, uh, sorry, for, uh, for each round, uh, each round uh, corresponds to one level. So after you finish one round, the level goes up. So at, at level three, uh, you start off with eight buckets, two to the, two to the level. 
Now, as I said, the way uh, that uh, partitioning happens here is that uh, the way that, that we split uh, data is, is incremental. So we start off at the very beginning <coughs> of the hash table, and every time we decide to split, we split one bucket. So we split, uh, so by this point, the next pointer is, uh, they, sorry, the next pointer keeps track of essentially what the next bucket is that we're going to split. So we've already split bucket uh, zero and bucket one. Um, and as you can see, uh, we've added the corresponding buckets to the end of, of the hash table. So um, every round, we, over the course of the round, we, should, we essentially double the size of the hash table. Uh, does everyone follow so far? Okay, so how do we do a lookup on this data structure? Let's say we have to do a lookup on the value k, and I'm going to tell you that the hash of uh, k is going to be some something, 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 one, zero, zero. We're going to take a look at the last two bits, uh, sorry, the last level bits of uh, the hash value, uh, so modulus to the level, and that's going to be one, zero, zero, uh, or four. Now, um, when we do the lookup, we compare uh, the hash value, modulo the, uh, to the power of the level. Uh, we compare that value uh, to the next pointer. If it's less than or equal the to the next pointer, then we're looking at a bucket that hasn't been split yet, um, at least not in this round. So we just use the last three bits to figure out which bucket it corresponds to. On the other hand, um, let's say that the hash value, modulo um, to our level, ends up with a value that's less than the next pointer. That means that this is a bucket that has been split thus far, and we need to look at an extra bit. And so uh, we actually do look at that extra bit, and depending on whether that bit is, sorry, that's a typo that should you, zero, uh, whether that bit is uh, one or zero, we either go to um, the, the buckets that have already been split in this round, or we would use the old buckets that have already been there. Any questions up to this point? Great. Uh, so what happens when we need to split? So first thing we're going to do is increase the increment of the next pointer. Then we're going to uh, take all of the, the data in the bucket that we're splitting, we're going to partition it on that extra bit, and then we're just going to append the extra page of data, basically everything that has uh, a one in that extra bit, and uh, append it to the end of this data file. Make sense?
cross over a little bit, and this, this is this is sort of a, con a consequence of the fact that uh, we only ever split the next bucket. Um, because of the fact that we only ever split the next bucket, it uh, now makes sense to potentially keep around a set of overflow buckets. Um, it, essentially, the idea is that we that this is this is sort of somewhere in between extendable hashing and uh, sort of a static hash table. Um, rather than double, uh, we don't double the size of the entire thing at once. We double it at more controlled bursts in, in more controlled bursts. And if we need to insert uh, data into the hash table in between in, uh, sorry, um, in between one of those bursts of resizing. Uh, then we may end up overflowing one of the buckets. Now you could certainly uh, look at this as, um, you, you could certainly pick a, a heuristic for deciding when to split uh, that triggered splits every time there was an overflow. Uh, so if, if you have an overflow, uh, you just split until there's no longer an overflow and just keep splitting. Uh, but this could potentially lead to uh, a lot of, a lot of IOs. Is that
already split all of the buckets before, so we have copies of them. And uh, we only care about the last two bits. So if we want to split this, we got an extra bit, and everything that had a zero would stay in the same bucket. Everything that had a, a one in the extra bit, so these are the two old bits. Everything that had a one in the next bit would go into the, the new page. That was Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Uh, what happens to that the whole two pages make any mistakes that one one into zero one one and one one? What happens to the whole two pages if it's connected to one one? Great question. So the question here is uh, what happens to the overflow uh, what happens to the overflow pages? Uh, if, if there is an overflow page here, what happens to it? Um, so essentially you treat this all of these pages as if they were one um, one block of data, and you partition all of that data uh, between the two new uh, the two new buckets. Uh, note that this doesn't guarantee that you'll get rid of the overflow page, uh, but uh, essentially any uh, again any record in this bucket or any of its overflow pages that has a zero um, in the third bit of its hash uh, goes here, and anything that has a one in the extra bit. And again, that may create new overflow pages. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Okay. Um, all right. So um, essentially, the the big problem with linear hashing is uh, deciding when precisely uh, to split your your buckets. And there's really no correct answer to this. Um, you can split whenever the next bucket is full. Uh, you can split after, uh, basically have a random chance of splitting every time you insert. Um, you can split after the hash table reaches a certain size. Um, or you can have some background process that, sort of, that keeps splitting uh, the, the hash table as needed. Um, and there's, there's really no, no good solution to this, uh, whatever, uh, whatever is appropriate for the application. Um, so I guess uh, bringing this back up to, the, uh, to a higher level, uh, I've just presented you with two, uh, two algorithms for doing um, hashing on disk, or building hash indices on disk. Uh, which one of them is better? Uh, well, typically I'd say yes. Um, the, but it depends on a number of factors. So the, the big drawback to extendable hashing is that you end up with uh, this directory page, uh, this direct, uh, these directory pages. And if those directory pages fit in main memory, which is typically going to be the case, yeah, uh, extendable hashing is almost always uh, a better call. Um, linear hashing has, has the advantage that you don't need to keep around an extra bit, of, uh, an extra couple of pages in memory. Uh, and if the data is accessed infrequently, it may actually be, be better just because um, it's much closer to a, a, a static hash table. And if the data doesn't change frequently, you don't actually need to split the, uh, the hash table particularly often. Um, then this saves you from having to keep anything in memory at all. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole range of, of uh, oh, there, there's actually one uh, additional benefit to linear hashing, um, possibly. Uh, so something to note is that linear hashing um, Extendable hashing has this directory page. It points to uh, additional pages of data. Um, whereas in linear hashing, you're essentially allocating pages in sequential order. Uh, is there a benefit to doing so? Yes. Say again? Easy access. Easy access in one case. Well, 
so if, if you're just using the index to access individual values, uh, you're going to be reading one page at a time. But is there, a, is there another benefit to having, oh, it, I mean, it does save you from having to go through the directory. But is there another benefit to having the, the pages organized sequentially? Uh, well, the, they're organized, uh, the data is, is not sorted in any particular way. So uh, you can't necessarily do a range lookup, but you're on the right track. Yeah, essentially. Uh, so if you have to do a full table scan, this is a much more efficient uh, way to, to build your index. Okay, uh, so any questions on hashing so far? Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a divergence from um, the, I'm gonna take a, a very brief uh, side, uh, side trek now and introduce a third um, sort of dynamic hashing strategy. Uh, now this is typically not used in um, databases, and you'll see why. Uh, sorry, in um, single, uh, single, uh, non-distributed databases, um, and you'll see why that is in a, in a little while. Um, but it's it, it's kind of a cute technique, and it kind of fits in here. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a taste of, of what's coming on, uh, what's coming up uh, later on in the term. So. Uh, Essentially, one of the big problems with extendable hashing, linear hashing, is this idea of splitting. Um, you have these, these fixed uh, bucket boundaries, and every time you, uh, you split, those boundaries change. Um, so the idea behind consistent hashing is let's do away with uh, those boundaries entirely. Let's just make them entirely non-deterministic. Um, and as it turns out, in a distributed setting, this works amazingly well um, to the point where um, there are sort of major data stores used at a lot of um, a lot of internet companies. Uh, Amazon and Facebook have developed two systems, uh, Dynamo and uh, Cassandra, I believe this is Facebook's. Um, that no, sorry, not Cassandra. Um, forgetting the name of Facebook's, but uh, basically there's a Major internet companies have, have essentially used this develop, to develop uh, distributed data stores. Uh, so, okay, um, let's let's look at the integers, um, or specifically the integers representable in, in 32 bits. Uh, big number line from zero to two to the 32nd minus one. Um, now, a uh, show of hands, uh, who has heard the term modular arithmetic before? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so the basic idea behind modular arithmetic is that you take that number line and you bring it together, to wrap it around into a big circle, uh, so that arithmetic works as you would normally expect it to, except if uh, you happen to overflow, so if you add one to two to the 32nd to minus one, you don't get two to the 32nd, you get zero. And it is essentially all of the values, all of the numbers that you use are as if they were modulo uh, two to the 32nd, or whatever the, the modulus is that you're using. So the numbers form sort of a, a ring. The idea of consistent hashing is that each bucket gets assigned to a random point on the ring. So uh, I have this big ring of numbers from 0 to 2 to the 30 seconds minus 1. And I'm going to say bucket A is represented by this point on the ring, whatever it is. And bucket B is going to be represented by that point on the ring. The idea, quite simply, is uh, you assign values to whichever bucket uh, has a, a sort of um, identifier that follows uh, the, the key value that you're hashing. So uh, any hash value that uh, falls in this range gets hashed to bucket A. Any hash value that falls in this range gets hashed to bucket B. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. You, you pick a random uh, set 
set of bucket partitions, and then uh, put data on each bucket. Now, why exactly is this helpful? Well, it means that any time you want to insert a new value, uh, sorry, insert a new bucket, all you have to do is uh, split one existing bucket. So you pick a random, you want to insert a new bucket C, you pick a, uh, a point on the ring, say here, and that happens to fall into bucket B. So a bunch of bucket B's values stay in bucket B, and a bunch of bucket C's values, uh, or sorry, a bunch of bucket B's values now become uh, part of bucket C. Um, any questions on this so far? Everyone understand? Uh, they're put, put in the bucket A, yes. Uh, there are replication tricks that you do uh, where you hash multiple buckets. Uh, in the interest of simplicity, I'm not going to get into those now. Okay, but uh, if we put everything in the same bucket, then what advantage is it giving to us? Because uh, so, ev sorry, all of the, the values that hash to, so every hash value um, falls between zero and, uh, let's say you're using a 32-bit hash, every hash value would fall in the range zero to two to the 32 minus one. Uh, so it fall, it, every hash uh, picks a point, uh, indicates a point on the ring. So any hash value that falls into one of these points uh, before A, but after B, that gets hashed to bucket A. Any, any hash value that falls here would hash to bucket B. Um, so you're, you're, you're still using three buckets. Uh, you're just sort of uh, setting the bucket boundaries um, red rather than having the, the single uh, deterministic strategy for, for partitioning. So my question is that um, suppose n values fall into the regular pair and they all will be added to the same bucket. Yep. Now the hash serves as the purpose that it helps us to look up, find the values in the order, in the order of one. But if you are putting n values in, the, in A itself, then it's again order of n search. So what's the advantage? Yep. You've, you've identified the, the main problem here. And this is why it's not used in um, uh, in single single node uh, databases. Um, as it turns out, there's actually a very nice algorithm for doing um, lookups of uh, doing decentralized lookups of these buckets in log n time. Um, again, I'm not going to get into that. There's a very nice paper. Um, I'd be happy to point you at it. It's called Cord. Um, and if you're interested, I encourage you to read it. Um, this is mostly sort of a sidetrack. I just wanted to, wanted to sort of give you a, a sense of uh, what we'll be covering later on in the term. Uh, but for now, uh, essentially, yes. So it's, this is an extremely expensive process. Uh, but as it turns out, there's a very nice de uh, decentralized algorithm uh, to, uh, to store, uh, to do these, these lookups of, um, of hash value. Which, which bucket of particular hash uh, value falls into. Does that address your question? Uh, and of course, the, the main advantage of this algorithm is that uh, splitting is extremely cheap. You can split any bucket at any time, and at most, uh, one bucket is affected. Or one bucket on a split, two buckets on a merge. Um, so, I don't know. Kind of cool. I encourage you to look at the paper. Uh, it's not directly in the critical path at the moment, but will be. Uh, it, it will probably come up later in the term. So, uh, all right. Let me um, start bringing this to a close. Uh, the the big challenge of hash tables is picking a size. Um, you pick the. You make a hash table too small you end up with uh, losing the benefits of a hash table. Uh, you pick it too big, you end up with a lot of wasted space and a lot of wasted IOs. So we've discussed a couple of different ways of uh, sort of dynamically adjusting the size of a hash table as values get added and deleted. Um, now, one thing I'd like to uh, cover before we uh, move on from indices is uh, this idea of multiple keys. So, so far we've, uh, we've been discussing uh, keys as if they had uh, individual values. 
uh, single numbers or occasionally strings. Um, now, as it turns out, this, the same basic principles can be applied to using uh, to having uh, multiple value keys. Uh, so, for example, uh, if if we have the key A B C, um, well, we can do an equality search for that key uh, just by restricting the search uh, to uh, those values where all the keys match. This is essentially the, the full equality. Um, but we can also do range searches. So we can, we can sort of uh, define an order over these multi, uh, multi-valued keys uh, based on their, uh, the order in which they appear in this, this sequence. Uh, so essentially, if we want to compare two, uh, two values, we first compare the A's. The A's are different, then uh, use that as, as the, the relative ordering of the two keys. Um, if the A's are the same, use the B's. B's are the same, use the C's, and so forth. Uh, this, well, uh, see an example of this in just a moment. Okay, so um, to give you uh, sort of a sense of how these indices fit into the big picture, um, there, there's a, a concept or a term called an access path. And every time you see a relation, in a relational algebra expression. Um, this essentially gets, in, in a database engine, this gets turned into what's called an access path, um, which is essentially just the way that you retrieve tuples from the database. Now, the most naive way of doing this, the, the most uh, straightforward and often the one that gets used is just a straightforward uh, file scan. You read all of the values uh, directly as, as they are on disk. Um, but if we have an index, this allows us to uh, look up values that match a particular uh, selection predicate. Uh, so a, a tree index is essentially going to allow us to match uh, any conjunction of terms uh, that match a particular uh, key. So if we build a tree index on, say, this, this uh, set of multiple keys, A, B, and C, uh, that is to say we've um, Use this technique uh, to uh, put put these the uh, so for, for every tuple we get a key a comma b comma c and so forth and uh, let's say one three six and uh, we were to compare this to two four eight. Uh, 248, uh, the 2 is bigger than the 1, so the 248 uh, is, ha has a higher value. If we were to compare uh, one, uh, 136 against 148, uh, the 1s have the same value, so we use the 3 and the 4 to distinguish. Is, is that what I'm following? Uh, let's see. So, um, if we built an index essentially on um, this, this combination of uh, keys A, B, and C, um, a tree index would match this, this would be appropriate uh, for answering a query um, that had a conjunction of terms that matched some prefix of this. Not necessarily the entire uh, key, but the, would have to match the first uh, couple of terms, uh, match on some prefix of it. So, um, if we had this, this uh, tree index on A, B, and C, uh, would we would uh, that tree index be able to efficiently answer the uh, query where we're selecting for A equals five? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about A equals five and B is greater than six? We get that. Uh, the uh, so. Uh, th this, this works best if, if everyone chimes in, so uh, I, I'd like to hear more than one person uh, responding to this. So, does this, uh, does the tree uh, index help us get to this? Okay, um, what about A is greater than 5 and B is greater than 6? Does the tree uh, index help us with that? Uh, I'm hearing both yeses and noes. Can I get an argument for the noes? Um, this this is actually meant to be a 
for or the the argument for no is that um, there a range search. The reason you can get a range uh, you can get a benefit on a range search is that a tree a tree index gives you uh, essentially a start point and an end point. Um, in, other, in other words, you can define a, a sort of a precise range of values uh, in the tree index that satisfy a particular uh, predicate. So in this case, uh, that range is uh, anything with starting at a equals 5, with b and c equal to negative infinity, and the upper bound on that range is a equals 5, b and c equals positive infinity. Uh, similarly, for a equals 5 and b is greater than 6, 5, 6, negative infinity is the lower bound, uh, 5, positive infinity, positive infinity uh, is the upper bound. In this case, there's not one precise range that gets us that. It's, um, there, there is no, uh, if we were to start at a, uh, at 5, 6, negative infinity, then we get everything that uh, all values that uh, were greater than uh, that had an a greater than five, and we'd also get uh, b greater than six. But we'd also get values such as um, as six, comma uh, three, comma one, um, which definitely satisfies this a is greater than five, but it doesn't satisfy b is greater than six. Um, so the, the argument for no is that this doesn't define a concrete range over, uh, over that particular key. However, that said, the a is greater than 5, we can, uh, we can use the a is greater than 5 to define a range of possible values. So essentially this becomes, uh, we, we sort of ignore the b is greater than 6 and apply that as a selection predicate on top of the values that are returned uh, by the tree index. Okay. What about uh, a is uh, less than 5, but greater than 3? Does that define a prefix? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, again, we have a range of values. What about b is greater than 6? No. 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 Uh, b is greater than 6. So there's no, uh, we have to look at every distinct value of a, uh, and this defines many ranges. So this index wouldn't help us. Okay, uh, yes, someone have a question? Um, all right, what about, uh, let's, let's look at hash indices as well. So uh, hash index uh, matches essentially any, con uh, any conjunction of terms uh, for which every single attribute in the index is defined precisely. So with a tree index, you have to define a precise range. Uh, with a hash index, you have to define a precise value of the entire key. So, um, does uh, the condition A equals 5 match a hash index on ABC? Does it return, assuming that we had precisely uh, one value for every A, B, and C, how many values would this return? Or, um, so uh, the, with the hash index, you have to define uh, you, you have to define every single attribute. No. Yep. So a equals five. No. What about a equals five and b equals six? Uh, a is less than five and b equals six and c equals four. Yes. No. No. Why? Yeah. So all of them have to be equalities. And what about a equals five, a equals six, c equals four? Okay, um, so essentially the idea here, you can have multiple indices on a single uh, data file, and the goal um, of, of a query optimizer, which we'll be covering next week, is to find the, uh, the access path that will return the fewest number of tuples, as known as the most selective access path to the, to the data. And uh, basically whichever index file or combination of these uh, that will give us all of the tuples that we need in the fewest IOs is uh, the one that we're looking for. Um, so essentially that's, that's going to be our main goal for the next few weeks. 
Um, but first, we'll be covering um, data modeling, which is going to lead us uh, into a couple of other optimizations. So um, once again, on Monday, uh, Dr. Kaminsky will be substituting. And uh, with that, enjoy the snow.